Land Rover touches these days seems to turn to gold. In 2017 alone, we've seen the Jaguar F-Pace win the World Car of the Year Award and the new Land Rover Discovery walk off with the Auto Express Car of the Year Award. So, with the new Range Rover Velar, it's got to be onto a winner, hasn't it? Well, it's available in usual flavours, petrol, diesel, and this first edition fancy expensive version. So we're going to take a ride to see if Jaguar Land Rover still has that Midas touch. The Velar is actually based on the same chassis as the Jaguar F-Pace, which is no bad place to start, but it's got a very different feel. Unsurprisingly, a very Range Rover feel. This car's available with air suspension. The Jaguar is not. This car's probably taking a slightly more refined, luxurious feel, where the Jaguar's a, a little bit more sporting. Not that this isn't a good car to drive. On the roads, we've been testing the car in Norway here. Slow but reasonably quick at times. You can't go above 80 kilometers per hour here. The car does feel very quiet, very poised when you can find a corner, but most of all, very, very refined. This is a quiet car. You can choose from three diesel engines. There are two versions of the Ingenium diesel with 240 and 180 PS, or the three liter V6 that's familiar throughout the Jaguar Land Rover range. That's the one I'm driving now. I quite like that version. It's probably a bit quieter than the Ingeniums based on the experience we've had of those engines so far. If you want to push things a little bit, there's a, uh, an Ingenium petrol version and a V6 petrol version using the supercharged engine from the F-Type. The thing I most like about this car is not how refined and relaxing it is to drive but the sense of style you've got. There is a, an interior in this car like no other SUV. Now, Land Rover's design director, Jerry McGovern, is a big fan of minimalist design, whether that's architecture or in this case, cars. And the interior here is just beautiful with two 10 inch touchscreens that you use for the infotainment, for the climate, and also the terrain response systems that this is a Land Rover, so it has to be able to go off road and it can go places where other cars can't. That's all controlled through these touchscreens and you can get a TFT display for the driver right here in the instrument binnacle. But it's clean, it's simple, most of all, it's classy. That's also the same on the outside where you've got really clean surfaces and fantastic pop out uh, door handles, which we haven't seen on a, on a Land Rover before. To drive this car isn't quite as sharp as an F-Pace, you wouldn't expect it to be, but it does ride really nicely. It's quite firm, but then when you hit a pothole, you realize actually the damping on this car is quite good. It's very comfortable and very, very quiet. It's a bit of tire rumble, but that's probably down to the, the big wheels and tires that the designers love. If you don't want as much road noise, get smaller wheels and tires, but then it doesn't look quite so nice. There's your choice. Most people with this car, I think, are gonna be drawn to it because of the styling, which means, yep, you go for the big wheels and tires, wouldn't you? Practicality-wise, that's a bit of a mixed bag. Huge boot, but I'm a big guy. I've set this car up for me, about six foot tall, and the seat is as far back as it goes. Try and sit behind me. It's actually a little bit tight, so if you're gonna carry kids in the back, Think carefully about it, make sure you can get your child seats in, or if you've got older children, make sure they're happy to sit behind you because the space isn't as good as in the Range Rover Sport. More expensive, bigger car, but you may want to trade up to that if you need to carry people in the back an awful lot. Being a Range Rover, this car will go up hills or through the river that we've got here next to us. It is a very capable machine, but is it a winner? Well, frankly, this car had me at hello. It is a sensational looking SUV. If you think it's good on the outside, it's brilliant on the inside, but it drives really nicely. The only thing I would say is make sure you can fit what you need to in the rear seats. It can be a little tight. If that fits your lifestyle, then yes, this car is another worthy addition 
to the brilliant... This all going to end? Well, who knows, but one thing is for sure. McLaren's customers certainly know what they want, which is why the 209,000 pound 710 bhp 212 mile an hour 720s is already sold out for the next year and remember this is a regular production road car not a limited edition one-off special the 720s is powered by a new four liter version of mclaren's familiar twin turbo v8 that's built by British engineering firm Ricardo. The tub is all new, says McLaren, and is called the Monocage 2, while the all-round double wishbone suspension is a development of the original computer-controlled system pioneered on the original 12C. Overall stiffness is way up, they say, and weight is well down compared with the 650S. There's also a lot more aero this time, while the electronic drive program has been simplified but improved to provide four settings, auto, comfort, sport, and track. The brakes are carbon ceramics, and the doors are the same dihedral design featured on the F1 all those years ago. They look great, but also make getting in and out a whole lot easier as well. And thanks to much narrower A-pillars that are made from carbon fiber this time, the all-round visibility is much improved too. McLaren launched the car in Italy last week at the fearsome Vallelunga circuit just outside Rome. So here's a little taster of what the 720S is like to drive. Right, 720S. I've just driven it from Rome to the circuit here at Vallelunga. I'm getting all sorts of beeping noises going on at me here because the tyre pressures are far too low, unfortunately. So I'm going to have to try and talk over those and we're going to have to just ignore them because McLaren have said just go out and ignore them because the tyre pressures are too low. But anyway, I've just driven it from Rome to Vallelunga on really horrible, rutted, nasty roads. And the ride quality and the overall refinement quality of this thing, if you dial it back into comfort, is absolutely extraordinary given what happens when you subsequently drive it on a track because I mean the 720 is one of these cars that it just makes you think where is this all going to end honestly how much more power how much more performance are they going to be able to throw at these things before somebody somewhere says no stop that it's silly, it's ridiculous, it's more than fast enough. I don't know. But then, you start to drive this thing properly in track mode, not in comfort mode, but in track mode, and it's absolutely flipping unbelievable. God, it's got so much aero grip. And the way it stops, it's just ridiculous. This car, you have to keep reminding yourselves that this car has got set number plates on it. Lovely, lovely steering as well. <coughs> bags and bags and bags of grip. And then just when you think it's gonna run out of grip, it gives you a little bit more. <laughs> I mean, this is third gear corner and the front is just pinned. Absolutely pinned. For God's sake. Oh, my word. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. gearbox just absolutely where you want it doing exactly what you want it to do the whole time McLaren's a bit cagey about the car's downforce numbers but in truth the 720s generates nearly 200 kilograms of the stuff at 150 miles an hour 
but it's the balance it displays at high speed that shows just how much progress has been made in this specific area. Dynamically, as well as in its cabin, its build quality, pretty much everywhere in fact, the 720S represents a huge leap forwards over the already quite tasty 650S. And for sure, there will be faster, lighter, more powerful, yet more ferocious versions to come, with both a Spider and an LT model already confirmed for the future. So the answer to that original question really is, who knows where it will all end? Just for a moment though, forget the moral dilemma that surrounds cars like the 720S, and sit back and indulge yourself for a while in this. McLaren will not admit as much publicly, but behind closed doors, they kind of, kind of prepared to admit that this thing is quicker than a P1. Certainly around a track like this, where there are no really long straights, and there are lots of twists, lots of turns, lots of heavy braking areas. And this car costs £209,000, £218,000 in this specification which has got a few carbon bits on it and the fruity seeds. And it's quicker than a P1, which remember costs one million pounds. So what are the bits that blow you away? Well, just about everything. I mean, the straight line performance is absolutely off the dial. <sighs> New four litre turbocharged engine, but there is no lag at all. And the response, that's 5,000, that's, Oh, for heaven's sake, it is just rude how fast this car feels. It, uh, if you weren't told it wasn't turbocharged, if you weren't told it was turbocharged, you wouldn't know. You would not know. There is lovely feel through the brake pedal. They've made quite a few changes to the suspension front and rear, although it is, no, it's not fundamentally a 650S. It is from that family of car, but, this is, this is stage two, basically, of that car. It's got what they call the Monocell 2 chassis tub, so another development of the carbon chassis. All sorts of tweaks to the gearbox, all sorts of tweaks to the suspension, steering, everything. They reckon, fundamentally, this car is 91% new. <laughs> Gosh, it made a very weird noise then, but I'm not sure it liked that, but oh dear, oh dear, I don't know where to stop. It's hard to know where to start, but it's even more difficult to know where to stop. And I'm gonna do that now, because I'm gonna get completely carried away otherwise. And unfortunately, all these warning lights are continuing to flash on the dash. It's actually saying stop vehicle now, so I'm wondering whether there might be a slight problem with one of the front wheels. But my goodness me, this is so much car for 209,000 quid. They should be charging another 100,000 quid for this, at least. This or a 488, I don't know, need to do it before I'm prepared to go anywhere near giving you an answer to that question. But be in no doubt, this thing is benchmark brilliant.
The GTR badge has become synonymous with some pretty tasty motorcars over the years, and the new AMG GTR you see here, all 577 horsepower of it, is no exception. The most powerful AMG in history is a full-on, no-compromise track monster. With adjustable traction control, a thundering twin-turbo V8 beneath its bonnet, and a £142,000 price tag to go with it. But what about the most famous GTR of them all? The one that's made in Japan and costs around half as much as its namesake from AMG. How does the legendary but now 10-year-old Nissan GTR stack up beside the one from Mercedes? We devised a variety of challenges to find out, starting here with a simple time trial through our favourite handling course, with both cars' various drive programmes set to maximum attack, but with their traction control systems still engaged. You can see from the split screen that they're pretty much neck and neck through the snake, despite the Nissan being four-wheel drive and, in theory, being the quicker of the two from point to point. The AMG understeers a little bit more than the Nissan, yes, as you can see, but if anything, it feels a touch lighter on its feet, a bit more agile and just quicker in a straight line than the original GTR. And by the end of the run, it just pips the Nissan by a single tenth. Next test, cornering, and specifically, how playful are these two GTRs on and a wee bit beyond the limit? Nissan first, and well, it doesn't do much really, other than just get round the corner very fast indeed with a hint of understeer and extremis, yes. Trouble is though, to get the best out of the Nissan, you need to disengage its ESC system. But if you do that, you invalidate the car's warranty, says Nissan. Hence the reason Nissan asked us not to touch the magic button. Whereas in the AMG, you can turn the eight stage traction control system right off and do this kind of thing in it all day long which might not be especially relevant to real-world driving, but on a track, it does give the AMG a key advantage. So the Mercedes wins this one, and wins it fairly easily. Test number three, the drag race. Except this time we've decided to make it a rolling drag race between 30 and 100 miles an hour, starting in second gear, in order mainly to eradicate the Nissan's eye-watering launch control advantage when it leaves the line and to see how they compare side by side without the vagaries of a launch sequence. And as you can see, they are almost impossible to separate. The AMG just about edging it again as they cross the line at 100 miles an hour. So once more, the Mercedes wins, just, but the Nissan is close enough behind it to almost not matter in the real world. Truth is, they are both outrageously quick in a straight line. Our penultimate test is one of noise, so we simply gunned each one from second gear upwards, towards and then away from the camera and our microphones. And, well, you can make your own mind up as to which one sounds best. Nissan first. Hmm. The 10 year old GTR still sounds pretty tasty. But now the Merc and mm, the AMG definitely sounds a bit more thunderous and a bit less technical than Nissan perhaps and it's definitely louder too. But which one sounds the best is in the end entirely subjective. And personally I love them both, but for very different reasons. Final test, subjective impressions. How do they make you feel when you're behind the wheel? So you get in the GTR and, you know, it's a quite amazing thing this, because this year, 2017, this car is 10 years old. And although, you know, some of the architecture does feel ever so slightly yesteryear because it's a bit, it's a bit kind of old tech computer geeky. But in most ways, this thing still feels utterly cutting edge. You kind of get the impression that all those years ago, they designed this car around the driving position first and then just attached the rest of the car to that because it's just beautiful the way you're located behind the wheel. And I love the fact that the whole dashboard moves up and down and the wheel moves in and out. So your kind of line of sight has this lovely consistency to it. You know, there is not a lot to complain about in here and an awful lot to get really excited about. It sounds really good. It's still got this kind of blend of fizzes and whooshes and 
a, a little bit of wine from the diff at the back, which, you know, if you, if, if you wrote that down on paper and said there's a bit of diff wine, you go, well, that's no good, let's iron that out. But I, just, I love it about the GTR. It just makes it feel really kind of analog and, and technical, if a little grainy in terms of its refinement. But, you know, the thing about the GTR has always been the way it goes. And this one, although it is a little bit more refined, it still goes like a train. Okay, this is how quick a GTR is in a straight line. I'm going to try and read off these numbers as we go. That's 25 miles an hour, second gear, put my foot down. 25, 36, 45, 50, 75, 80, 90, 100. <laughs> I've just short shifted, it's 120. From 30 to 120, that fast. Okay, it absolutely munches through fuel. <laughs> if you put your foot down, if you use the throttle with enthusiasm. And no, the ride's not too brilliant, but, and the rear seats are a bit pathetic. I mean, it takes up a massive amount of road space, considering how little space there is inside. Boot's pretty big, but are we really that worried about the boot space in a car like this? Final point about the GTR, is it still represents a quite incredible amount of value for money. 85 grand this thing costs in this spec. That is half the price of the Mercedes. And no way is the Mercedes twice the car of the GTR. No way. I have to say, the moment you get into the AMG GTR, it does feel pretty special. I mean, there's this huge long bonnet out in front of you, and it almost feels as if you're sitting on the floor. Proper, not sports seats, I'd almost call these race seats. They're, I mean, they absolutely clamp your torso in position. And the dashboard is quite sort of old fashioned and analog in that there are kind of traditional instruments, but it it definitely feels more modern than the GTR inside, just because it is. I mean, you know, there's, there's nine, 10 years difference in the fundamental architecture of the two cars. I'm not sure this thing feels nine years younger, but it definitely feels ever so slightly from another era. But the defining thing with this AMG GTR, obviously is the way, it, one of the things is the way it looks, especially in green, but it's just the way it sounds. It's utterly rude. And those crackles on the overrun and on upshifts as well if you're in race mode which i am it's just it properly adds to the experience what you can do in the mercedes you just can't quite do in the in the nissan and that is the big ones of those i mean it just does it mag Magnificently. It goes, when it goes to begin with, because the diff response is pretty aggressive. If you've ever tried to put an M3 sideways and thought, my word, that got away from me a bit quick, recalibrate your brain because it goes even faster in this thing. I mean, as a result, you need to put the lock on pretty fast. The fact that it's got these Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2s on it as well just means there's a bag of grip and then you just fall straight off the grip. But, nah, it's a very, very special piece of kit, this. I don't think it feels twice as much money as the Nissan, because in a straight line and everything, you know, dynamically, there's not a lot between them. But just to climb in and be in and spend time in, yeah, it kind of feels very expensive indeed and very, very lovely. So there you go. When the original GTR meets the latest one from AMG, there are fireworks. And inevitably, the GTR that's newest and almost twice as expensive just about edges it in the end. But look, in reality, these two are genuinely great high-performance cars. And personally, I reckon I'd take the 10-year-old GTR over the latest one from AMG and trouser the change. But if you were to think differently, you'd not be wrong either. The Ford GT has taken just three years to go from drawing board to full production, 
which in supercar terms is no time at all. But then the GT is based unashamedly on the car that won its class at Le Mans last year, 50 years after the GT40 won outright at the legendary 24 hours. And in sports car racing, they don't tend to mess about when it comes to deadlines. The GT road car costs 450 grand and is powered by the exact same 3.5 litre twin turbo V6 that propels the racing car. It has a carbon fibre tub at its core with a 7 speed dual clutch gearbox integrated into its inboard suspension at the rear. Its top speed is a decently outrageous 216 miles an hour and it'll do 0 to 60 in 2.8 seconds with 0 to 100 miles an hour somewhere between 5 and 6 seconds. And this, albeit briefly, is what it's like to drive with a man called Dan sitting in the passenger seat. Alright, ready when you are. Good fired up. Uh, can we go sport to start with and then track? We have, the move? we have to start we have in to order to, to do that. The GT has five different drive modes, but the only two you use on a circuit are sport and track. And it gets pretty tasty in track, as we'll see. But to begin with, I went out in sport. Okay, so here is just a couple of very, very privileged laps in the new Ford GT. All 450,000 quid of it. At the moment, I'm in sport mode, so we're not. We haven't got the 50 millimeter drop in ride height, but we've got the full 638 bhp. We've got crazy amounts of torque with a really flat torque peak between about three and a half and six and a half thousand revs. The weight of this thing. Considering its rear-wheel drive and has 638 bhp plus a whopping 747 newton meters of torque, the GT's traction out of slow corners is utterly incredible. And the way it stops, as you can see, is even more extraordinary, thanks in part to a full electronic air brake at the back and massive carbon ceramic discs at each corner. Feels really nicely balanced.
Ford says the GT is quicker than a McLaren 675LT around any circuit, having bought a McLaren and benchmarked it endlessly against its new car themselves. Mind you, quite how it would fare against the considerably faster new 720S McLaren is another question for another day. And remember, the McLaren costs less than half the price of the GT. It's the brakes that you have to get used to the most. Because it just, where am I going? It just stops on the six points. It being, it, it goes, it stops even better than it goes, which just sounds crackers. Right. That is my little play in sport mode. Am I allowed, Mr. Instructor, to have one lap on the gun and have some track mode? The GT was so physical and so fast to drive in track mode that in the end I just shut up and drove it and it was thoroughly awesome and very quick indeed around the lap. some time in the GT on the road and to be brutally honest I didn't think it was all that great and there were various reasons why. Away from the track the GT felt like a very big very wide pretty intimidating car to drive with nowhere near as much mechanical refinement as you'd expect for a £450,000 car. It felt a bit like a duck out of water on the road to be honest even though its ride comfort was weirdly impressive with the electronic dampers set to comfort. Conclusion? As a daily driver, the GT is nowhere beside its nearest rivals from Ferrari, Porsche or McLaren. Make no mistake about that. But as a track weapon, it is very special indeed. Unique even. Just as you'd expect from a car that is essentially a Le Mans racer that's been legalised for the road. Welcome to the all new Bentley Continental GT. It's been almost five years in the making, looks about 10 times sexier than the previous model, and has seen Bentley's engineers collaborating with Porsche all the way down the line. The result is a machine that weighs a mere 76 kilograms less than the old model, but which is, claim its creators, massively improved in every single dimension. It costs just shy of 160 grand and is powered by a brand new 6 litre W12 twin turbo engine that produces 626 bhp plus a whopping 900 newton metres of torque. 
As before, it's four-wheel drive, but this time it comes with an eight-speed dual-clutch gearbox and has fully computer-controlled suspension. As such, it is easily the most sophisticated GT car Bentley has ever produced. And not only is it more comfortable and refined than before, but also a lot more sporting to drive, says Bentley. Which is why they took us to Anglesey Circuit recently to let us have a go in it. We also drove it on the road. And as you can discover, we weren't exactly disappointed by what we found. So I have driven the new GT on the road, but we didn't quite get time to film any of that. It's a bit of a hectic schedule today. And as Bentley are claiming, it is definitely a little bit more comfortable, definitely a little bit more refined on the road. I think the ride quality has got, if anything, better still. And it just has a lovely fluidity and a bit less drag simply to the way it goes down the road. And it feels out outrageously fast on the road as well as it's going to with 626 horsepower and 900 newton meters of torque but the area in which Bentley is claiming that the GT has made a really big step forwards with its Panamera underpinnings it's not actually fair to say Panamera underpinnings they jointly develop these cars but anyway the, the area that it's leapt forwards rather than just crept forwards is in its sporting and dynamic abilities and that's why they brought us to Anglesey because they're basically saying that this thing is, well, they're sort of saying it's a sports car. Can it really be labelled as a sports car when it weighs 2.4 tonnes with me in it? I don't know. Let's find out. Because this is one of the better tracks and we know Anglesey really well. <laughs> the fact that you can do that in it straight out of the box is quite nice. Do you know? I'm not sure they're wrong, because you always wonder about these things and you have to you have to take their claims with a pinch of salt. Because when people say that they've built a sports car, you think, oh yeah, pull the other one. But this thing, it's spookily agile. quick in a straight line but it's just it just simply doesn't feel anywhere near as heavy as the numbers say it is if the numbers say 2.3 something kilograms I'm saying 17 to 1800 kilograms I'm getting a beep because the real spoilers coming up it shouldn't do that well it should do but not there the GT suspension is a deeply sophisticated mix of conventional wishbones at the front and a multi-link rear end but with a mix of computers and air to control every millimetre of its travel. Its wheels and tyres are 22 inches in diameter and all up it weighs over 2.2 tonnes. But as we discovered the way it manages its weight is extraordinary especially on a track. But you can really chuck the GT around and you can use its weight to your advantage. It has great turning like that there. So the rear is just wanting to come out under power and then you get on the power and it sends, what is it, 83% of the drive from the four wheel drive system to the rear axle when you're in sport mode. And obviously we're on a track so I am in sport mode. So you get 83% of the torque 83% of the power all going to the back axle and that fundamentally means it becomes a rear wheel drive car which is why you can do all the stupid stuff in it and yet if you dial it back on the road if you put it into Bentley mode I think you only ever get about 37-38% of drive going to the front axle so but it still becomes much more like a four wheel drive car and so you get all the stability that comes with that. But you don't want that on a track, you just want to hoon it around like a maniac. And when you do, I mean the previous car, the previous car absolutely would not take what I am doing to this car. It would just wash out and you'd have no other option left in your armoury. You just have to slow down and get yourself a bit more space. I mean, that is just, you shouldn't be able to do that in two and a half times worth of Bentley. 
What I also love is the brakes. The brakes are really powerful. The biggest, they're claiming that this thing's got the biggest brakes of any production road car there has ever been, ever, amen. And they are massive, but they're, right, they're only steels, but flipping hell, they slow this down thing well. Paddle shift gearbox this time round, as per last time, but this time it's a full dual clutch. It's a, it's, it's a PDK box from a Panamera. Just works really well. But it's the chassis agility does your brain in. Is this car a sports car? No, it is not a sports car, but it is a very, very sporting GT car, right at the far end of how sporting a GT car can actually be. I'm just a bit amazed by it, actually. And you, and you know what the other thing is about the Bentley GT, the new Bentley GT? It costs 156 grand, which is only a few grand. And when I say a few, I mean two or three, four grand more than the outgoing model. And yet it's so much better than the old car in every single way. I mean, it's rivals of the S-Class Coupe and the DB11. Gosh, the poor old DB11. I'm not sure how that would get on against this thing. Without doing it back to back, you never know, but I've got a feeling this thing might take care of a DB11. Sorry, folks, at Aston Martin, but you've got a proper rival in the shape of this car. It's really, really good. Quite apart from being surprisingly good to drive, the GT is also just a lovely thing to be in, with the kind of exceptional levels of quality and craftsmanship you'd expect from a Bentley, but with a distinctly sporting edge also in this case. Overall, we loved it, not just to look at and be in, but to drive on, on both road and track. Bottom line, this could well be the best GT car in the world right now, and very possibly